Thank you. Boy, that's so somebody introduces somebody who introduces me. You, and I feel like I'm the holy of holies or something. That you you have to Well, that's that was a lot of work just to get me up here. I hope I'm worth it. I well, I'm giving I giving a kind of keynote uh to, uh, to everything we're going to do today. Uh brief but a great it's a, a fairly brief but a great um set of topics on reaching the city, renewing the city. And uh, what I want to do is give you an overview. My talk here is reaching the city with the gospel or reaching the city for Christ. I, I'm basically going to divide what I'm about to say into two parts. Uh, the, the, thir- the second part, in some ways, is the most practical. I want to talk about how do you um, catalyze, how do you uh, bring together Christians and churches and ministries in a city in such a way that they... Uh, interact with each other, they support each other, they mutually stimulate each other, they symbiotically relate to one another. Um, and I want to get to that second, but I found over the years, the last couple of years, is I, if I uh, go right to that without giving in the broader context, maybe laying some foundations, some of it might be misunderstood. So let me do it this way. Why we should reach cities, what we need to know in order to reach cities, and how we reach cities. And the why and the what is the setup, okay? Why? Now, what I'm about, and also what I'm about to say is going to be relatively uh, top level, and actually some of the various uh, workshops and seminars are going to drill down more into some of these topics. But why should we reach cities? Maybe I'm preaching to the choir. You wouldn't be here if you didn't think we have to reach cities. But it's, a, it's a helpful to remember four things, especially as you're talking to people. You've you got to have these in your own heart, or you're not going to stick with it, because reaching cities is hard. Uh, One is, the Bible talks about the importance of cities and reaching cities for God's redemptive purposes. If you actually read the whole Bible through, you'll see in the beginning, cities are actually seen in a pretty negative light. Uh, Cain built a city, and things weren't great after that. Uh, You know, Adam, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, Lot, you know, went and lived in the cities. Abraham stayed out of the cities. It wasn't so good for Lot. Uh, you know, in the uh, Tower of Babel was actually the first skyscraper. That wasn't so great. Uh, and in the beginning, cities are seen in a negative way. But as you go through, as you actually read the Bible through as a single story, you'll see more and more cities become important. Jerusalem is one of the ways in which God is showing the world his glory through an, a, 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 a redeemed urban society. Uh, and then later on, when the children of Israel are scattered, uh, they say, if you, God says, if you want my redemptive purpose to move on, you need to love, seek the peace of Babylon, the pagan city in which you are now uh, uh, living. And later on, of course, you get to the New Testament. Cities are, are the basis for the missions of uh, the missionary strategy of St. Paul and of the early Christians. They went to cities first. And so if you actually read the Bible, you see increasingly uh, the Bible shows cities to be extremely important for what God's doing in the world. And on we come to now. I mean, the Bible actually makes it... The Bible has a positive view of the city, would you say that? Well, the Bible's very realistic. Cities are, is, is human nature writ large. And of course, human nature means image of God, and yet at the same time, depravity and sin. And therefore, no, the, the Bible doesn't have a rosy picture of cities, but the Bible says there is nothing more important than that we reach cities. And you can make a case for that, but we're not going to do that right now. But you have to know that. You have to sense that. That, uh, according to the Bible, it's important for you to be in cities. Second reason that we have to reach cities is because cities are increasingly uh, not only important, cities more and more determine how human life is lived in the world. Recently, foreign policy, the Financial Times, and actually recently some others, uh, have done major uh, uh, special issues in which they looked at what's happening to the great cities of the world. Cities are more and more influential. Uh, in the Financial Times, uh, they, meant, they said, this is last year, that the 100 largest global cities, the 100 greatest global cities in the world, produce 30% of the entire world's economy and almost 100% of its innovation. Because all the ideas come out of the cities now. And because of technology and globalization, it, what happens in the big city spreads. In some ways, the world is really becoming urban. If you care about how human life is lived, if you want to have any influence on it as a Christian, if you, if you want to have any influence on how human life is lived in the world, you've got to minister in cities. Thirdly, so we go because the Bible, 
says it's important. Secondly, because cities are increasingly influential to how life is lived in the world. Thirdly, for missions now, if you want to reach the younger generation, in any, in any country, younger adults disproportionately want to live in cities. They want to go there, they do go there. You want to reach the next generation? They go to cities. You want to reach the people who influence the, how the culture is going? You go to cities. You want to reach the poor? Isn't that part of what the Bible says we have to do? They're in cities too. And by the way, Ed Glazer, Edward Glazer, who's just written a tremendous book, which I suggest you read, called The Triumph of the City, says cities don't produce poverty. Cities attract the poor because cities are great places in many, many ways. Very interesting. He, says, he makes a really good case in saying uh, cities are places that actually, uh, out in the third, two-thirds world, the poor in the rural areas, if you're poor in a rural area, you have no chance of ever changing. But if you come into cities, and cities are filled with poor people, you got some chance. And the poor are pouring into the great cities of the world because uh, there's prospects there. They're attracted by cities. And even though there's a lot of poverty and there's a lot of, it's terrible. And if you're a Christian, you care about the poor in the cities. Nevertheless, it's not a sign of the weakness of the city. It's a sign of the strength of the city. There's just so many poor people there. And, uh, and also, there's all sorts of unreached people groups. People groups that if you are trying to reach them in their home country, or in their home region, you might have your head literally chopped off, but here they are in your city. And there they are, essentially, humanly speaking, they're accessible. And they can hear the gospel. And so if you care about missions, you care about reaching the younger generation, you care about reaching the poor, you care about reaching the, uh, the influencers, you care about reaching the unreached peoples of the world, you've got to go to cities. One more thing. Cities are growing so fast, it's frightening. Uh, Yes, somewhat in this country, uh, some more than others, but in the overall world, you know the statistics, I'll be real brief, 250 years ago, 5% of the world's population lived in cities. Today, it's passing 50%. Uh, the most interesting, and this is growing, is about 5 million people every month move into the biggest global cities of the world. 5 million people, all told, across the world, every month. You know, Rio de Janeiro is a city of 10 million people, which means there's a new Rio de Janeiro being started every two months in the world. How many churches should there be in Rio de Janeiro? How many churches should there be in any kind of city of 10 million people in the world? Would you want dozens? No. You would, we want hundreds at least. Would you want thousands? Yes. We should be starting a couple thousand urban churches every month, or we're falling behind, and we are falling behind. You know, you, whenever people hear me talk about you need to have Christians in cities, they say, don't we need Christians everywhere? Don't we need Christians, you know, everywhere there's people? And the answer is, absolutely. We need Christians and churches everywhere there's people, but the people of the world are moving into cities way faster than the church is. And as a result, we are falling behind. As a result, it's the, the cities are the least well-served places in the world by the church. And therefore, we need to reach the city. These are, you've got to have this in your heart, or you're not going to stick with reaching the city, because reaching the city is hard. You, gotta, you, you have to have these compelling, uh, these goads. You know, you know when, remember, in, one, uh, remember when, when uh, Paul says that at one point when the Lord appeared in this, you know, his road to Damascus vision, uh, Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads were the... You know, the, the, the pricks that the, that the shepherds used to use to stick the, the, uh, uh, the sheep so that they would keep moving. And I would have to say that I don't know that through the hard times of urban ministry and living in cities, you would stick with it. If you didn't have these biblical and cultural and logical and demographical <laughs> reasons why you ought to be there. Number two, what? what now, I'm really going to be basic here because... Uh, these are some of the things I believe are going to be covered in the other uh, workshops. What do you have to know to reach cities? You don't just need motivation, what do you have to know? Three things I'd like to suggest. One is, I do believe that you need to have a, theo a biblical theology of the city. I don't think we're well served by much of what's out there. I mean, when people say to me, what does the Bible say about the city? It's hard to find books on it. It's hard to find anything on it. Uh, certainly the work of Harvey Kahn, uh, my old friend and 
mentor who's gone now, and there's others that have written on it, but it's, this stuff, a lot of it's out of print, it's not easy. Um, I, 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 we're putting together some stuff at Redeemer City to City, we're trying to put a book together that's going to have some of it in there. But I do think it's important for you to have a, a grasp of what the Bible says about the cities, both good and bad, and especially about its importance. Enough said there. Number two, I don't think you're going to do well in the city if you don't also know about how fast cities change and even about why they change. Here's where I'd love to um, suggest again that you pick up the book by Edward Glazer called The Triumph of the City. It's not a Christian book. I hope I didn't give you that impression. But what he does is he, he notices how, cities, how many cities now are just churning forward, how successful they are. Uh, there are uh, exceptions. And, and, you know, sadly, there are exceptions. There are cities that are still declining. There are some smaller cities. I mean, he, he, he brings up Leipzig in Germany and Detroit in America that, that are not, they're, they're still struggling a great deal. But an awful lot of cities are reinventing themselves. And, uh, and as I look out there, even though it's, it's so bright up here and it's so dark down there, but from what I can tell, I have to say, when I'm looking at a lot of you, I say, when I was your age, because a lot of you look young, um, cities were commuter cities, and that is, they were like donuts, really. You had poor, non-white people in the center, dangerous down there, you know, and prosperous, white suburbs around it, and the people with the good jobs lived in the suburbs and commuted in just to go to work, and then they got out. Boy, that has changed. You know, 40 years later now, uh, we have the rise of re something that never, I could, nobody could have ever imagined. It's the reverse commuter. There's lots of them. Cities are such desirable places for many people to live downtown that many people live down and are willing to pay the price, the money to live downtown. And if they get a life, if they get a, a job outside, they go that way. There's an enormous amount of reverse commuting. Uh, not only that, you now have mul a multi-ethnic middle and a multi-ethnic suburbs. It's not like Non-whites in here, whites up here. Oh no, you got, you got, it's multi-ethnic and poor sometimes in the suburbs. And it's multi-ethnic and often rich and poor in the, in the city. It's much more complicated than it used to be. But it's reinvented itself. And Ed Glazer says, uh, there's a great danger. You start a ministry, he doesn't talk about ministry here, but he says you start in a city, you think, I know what cities are like. You look back for the last 20 or 30 years, you know what a city's like. Cities have the power to change because the, the urban constants are agglomeration, human capital, and innovation. Agglomeration, well, I mean, human capital means this, the most ambitious and the most risk-taking people tend to go to cities. And we're not just talking about the college educated, we're also talking about the poor. We look across the, the world and across history uh, the people who are the most willing to take risks, the people who are most adventurous, the people who are most ambitious, the people with vision usually, the people who wanted to, uh, wanted to try their talents out, they go to cities. So cities are always places of uh, unusually high human capital, but agglomeration is the sociological term for living in proximity. And when you take, when you take um, the, uh, the, the, the strong human capital and you put it into close proximity, all kinds of stuff happens. All kinds of Innovation happens all the time, and cities reinvent themselves. And you've got to, one, to me, one of the hardest things about doing urban ministry is keeping, keeping track of the changes that are happening in your very neighborhood, the changes that are happening in your very city. Otherwise, you can just get behind, way behind. And I think that's one of the great challenges is to see that cities, are, there, there are some constants about cities, and one of the constants is they are, they are always changing. But they will, they, there's a power in cities uh, they're not going away. Boy, they're not going away. And they, and they are going to, they, they're going to reinvent themselves and put themselves on top and say, we're showing the way forward for the human race. And they keep doing that, and they have been doing that for thousands of years. You need to know about the change. You need to know about the theology of the city. One other thing. Um, it is nip typical now for a lot of folks to say, I want to start churches in cities, and they're not sensitive to the kind of churches that ought to be um, the kind of churches that are effective in cities. And what I'm about to tell you when I get to Hal, which is about five minutes away, uh, we're going to talk about church planting. But I, I, and some, I think probably in some of the workshops you'll be talking about this. 
but the churches that you plant here have got to be churches that fit the urban environment. And uh, this is my very fast, top-level little set of uh, characteristics of those churches. Uh, anybody who works in the city will have its, their own list. I don't want you to say, this is Tim Keller's list, this is it. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of other ways of breaking this down, but here's what they are. You've got to know that urban churches, ought to be, they are different. They ought to be different. Oh, not different in, in the basics. They have to have the, you know, take your doctrine of the church course, and they have to have the marks of the church, preaching the word, and baptism, Lord's Supper, and discipline. They've got to, you know, they have to preach the word right. They have to uh, worship, edify, witness. I mean, I'm not saying that urban churches are... Uh, not a category under the universal church. I mean, they're, they're separate, but they are, they're distinct inside what a biblical church should be. And uh, here's, what, here's my seven. One is uh, urban churches have to be extremely aware of cultural differences. Let me just say something. <laughs> if you're in America, now I'm talking to Americans for, for a minute, for American city. If you're a white person in America, uh, we are the dominant culture. And that means that when you go into cities in order to minister, you're at a disadvantage. You know why? Every minority knows there's, a di there, there, there's different cultures, but white people don't know that, really. Now, a very simple look. White people have a, there's a way to make decisions. There's a way to express emotion. There's a way to handle conflict. There's a way to schedule time. And white Americans do all that. And non-white Americans know that there's a white way to do all those things, but we don't. We just think that's the way things are done. Non-urban people tend to believe that everybody thinks like they do. But if you're a real urban person, you know that's just not true. And that is a harder thing for white people. I know white people come into cities to do ministry, and after 10 years, they still are not really urban. Because they still act like, well, this isn't the white way to do things. This is just the way things are done. Uh, what what non-white people want from white people in America generally is they, they, don't, they don't want you to stop being what you are, but they want to be surprised. They want to be surprised that you do understand there's a difference. And even though churches, there is no neutral way to do anything. That, that, one, of the, one of the hard things about urban ministry is there really isn't a neutral, multi-ethnic way to make decisions or a neutral, multi-ethnic way to do music or a neutral, multi-ethnic. The fact of the matter is different cultures do things differently and as soon as you start to decide, as soon as you start to do things, you are, to a great degree, reflecting one culture or another. But in the urban setting, you should be working like crazy to make sure you have as much, much breadth of appeal as possible. You have to show awareness that there's differences, even when you're doing something in a certain way, so that you do it with humility. And urban churches and urban church leaders know there's always going to be tension because it's going to be a multi-ethnic ministry. It's got to be because the, church, the city is more multi-ethnic. It's more multi-ethnic than it was 40 years ago when all the white people are out there and all the black and Hispanic people are in here. I mean, now everything's mixed up, and it's harder than ever to do urban ministry unless... Uh, and you expect the tension, but urban leaders pay that price. They know that's part of it. They know there's always going to be tension. There's always going to be questions. And they're always going to be having to think about those things. And urban people will do that. They're sensitive to those differences. They're patient with those differences. They work. That's number one. Number two, awareness of neighborhood injustice. Many people who come into the cities today to live, this is what Edward Glazer says. He says, he says many of our cities today are consumer cities. They're urban theme parks. People come into the cities because there's so much entertainment. There's so many restaurants. There's so many comedy clubs. There's so many, there's so many theaters. There's so much to do. That's why they're willing to stay here and commute out to, their, uh, to their, uh, uh, their job. But because of that, they tend to look at the city as a place, that, uh, as, a, as a park, a place where they get entertained. Instead of looking at where they live, their neighborhood is a place where they're supposed to be doing justice and, and loving their neighbor. And... Uh, you can, I think, get away, perhaps, without looking like utter hypocrites in non-urban places by ignoring the needs of your neighborhood, because very often the neighborhoods you live in outside the cities have pretty, pretty functional so social systems, but in the city, even in the so-called gentrified areas, there's a lot of problems. Even the gentrified areas very often have got a lot of poor people in them. You may, they may be invisible, there may be government housing, there may be drug rehab centers, there might be a public school. 
that uh, kids are bused from other places so it's very poor even though they couldn't afford to live in there. Uh, in other words, in urban, set, in urban neighborhoods, those neighborhoods got, have got problems. And as an urban church, you've got to show the neighbors that you are kind of trying to make that neighborhood a better place for everybody to live, whether they believe like you do or not. Number three, you've got to have, you got to, yeah, by the way, urban churches have got to help people integrate their faith with their work. Uh, the people who go to cities tend to be, as I mentioned, human capital in cities tend to be people who are ambitious, people who are creative, people who are trying to get something done with work, with their talent, with their inner field. And as a result, they are more absorbed, I think, and that's fine, by their, their jobs or their career or their work than perhaps the average commuter. And uh, if, you, if you're trying to uh, help people be disciples in the city, you've got to help them integrate their faith with their work. In other words, how does my faith uh, not just influence how I come, how I am when I, on church on Sunday, but all the, all the time. Because people in the cities live in their jobs. They may have 50, 60, 70 hours a week in their work. And if, if what you're telling them about the gospel has no relevance to all that, that's virtually a way of saying the Bible has nothing to say to, you know, 80% of your life, only 20% of your life. Uh, number four, urban churches own the complexity of evangelism. There's just not one way to do evangelism, and you've got to do it in cities. In London, I remember having a, a seminar on evangelism, <laughs> and the pastor said, we've got two kinds of non-Christians in our neighborhood. We have Muslims and Hindus who think Christians are unbelievably uh, licentious. They've got no moral standards. Uh, you know, anything goes. So we've got Muslims and Hindus that think Christians are incredibly spineless when it comes to morality. And we've got secular British people who think Christianity is too moralistic and narrow-minded. And he said, could you give me a gospel presentation that would work with both? And I said, no, I don't think there is. You're going to have to have at least two. And you have to own the complexity of evangelism. Uh, number five, we already talked about this in a way, urban sensibility. There is a suburban sensibility, urban sensibility. Um, if you're from the highlands of Scotland and you move to Baghdad, you expect big cultural changes and you're tolerant with them. You say, okay, I gotta learn you know, how people do things here. But if you move from <laughs> highlands of Scotland to Glasgow, um, first of all, you may not notice the small differences. You may not notice that everybody's laughing at the way you dress. And when you do find out they're laughing at the way you, dr you dress, you don't say, well, I need to learn how to adapt to the culture. You say, those snobs. In other words, when you move from a non-urban part of America into the urban, the small but very important difference is you have a tendency either to ignore or you have a tendency to despise. So, for example, uh, suburban people like privacy, safety. They like uh, sentimentality, homogeneity. They like space, order, control, and predictability. And urban people hate all those things. They hate them, precious. They, they like risk, they like diversity, they like irony, they like chaos, they like unpredictability. And you know, you can just despise that and just ignore that, and you'll get new people who have moved to the city too, and they haven't been there long enough to really become part of the culture. Is that all you want to do? Um, and I'll just give you one last one. Um, urban churches have got to be a lot more sensitive to both artists and artistry. Now, you know, by the, see, I don't want to take away what all the other seminars are doing, but um, outside of the city, artists are kind of like slave labor. Uh, you know, they, um, you know, we use them, uh, to, you know, to do our graphics, we use them to do our, you know, our music and that sort of thing. But in the cities, the artists are part of the, of the, they're, they're part of the city. They're part of the people you're trying to reach. And uh, they must be uh, enfranchised and they must be felt, they must feel like they're, you know, they're part of the church and their sensibilities should be uh, reflected. And therefore, frankly, I do think urban churches probably have to have somewhat of a higher bar when it comes to artistry, but they certainly have to find ways of both being more sensitive to art and artists, artistry and artists, than they, um, uh, maybe a lot of non-urban churches, a lot of non-urban churches can get away with that and it really not harm you, but I don't think you can do that in the city. How? 
Why? What do you have to know? And how? I'm using a term called ecosystem. Now, by the way, every analogy falls short. When I think of an ecosystem, I'm thinking of a biological system in which all the various organisms are mutually interdependent. Now, there's another way to look at an ecosystem. It's where the strong eat the weak. And uh, let's, let's ignore that aspect of the analogy, okay? And let's, let's, let's uh, uh, play up this other side. What I believe you need in order to really uh, reach a city is not just a church or even a few churches or even a, you know, a fair number of good churches of your particular denomination. You need a movement. It takes a movement to reach a city. And here's how I like to define a movement. I like to define it as three concentric circles. At the center, there has to be gospel theology, though I would like to say it's not just doctrine. It's not less than doctrine. There has to be a consensus amongst the churches who are doing this movement uh, together that uh, the gospel is true, that the biblical gospel is true. But I would also suggest sometime somebody out there take a look at Rick Lintz's book, The Fabric of Theology, in which he uses a term called theological vision. And he says, he says, people with the same doctrinal framework, that is, you, you know, let's just say you're both conservative Baptists or conservative Presbyterians, or you have the same doctrine, could have two different theological visions, because a theological vision is an understanding of how to communicate and embody that doctrine in this time and place. So you can have the same doctrine and be very different in your basic concept of how we're going to get that out. I actually think that for a movement to exist, certainly you can be cross-denominational, and there can be an awful lot of, of diversity. There has to be uh, a kind of consensus around a basic theological vision of how we're going to get the biblical gospel out there in the world. And that's the middle, okay? It's obviously, that, would, that could easily be a whole series, a whole three-hour course in seminary, but we're moving on to ring two. Ring two is several church planning movements in your city, preferably uh, church planning movements that represent different denominations and traditions. Uh, I know what I'm about to say is controversial, so, so what? I, I can say it anyway, I guess. Uh, here's a couple of things. First of all, um, even though this is not an exact science, over the last 200 years, we've discovered that if a city has one church for every 10,000 people, you probably have about 1% of the population going to church. If you have uh, one church for every thousand residents, you have more like 12 to 17 percent of the population going to church. If you can get that ratio down to one church for every 500 residents, that number can go up as high as 40 percent. Uh, and therefore, when you look at your city, the, the main way to increase the number of the body of Christ so that, it's, so that the number of Christians is growing faster than the population at large, so that the body of Christ is becoming more and more um, an influence for, of grace and truth in the city, you've got to plant a lot of churches. You just have to, a whole lot. And, uh, what, I mean, I could tell you some stories, but I won't, because I'm going to keep on going on this. But the other thing uh, you need is you need a number of different church planting movements uh, and here's the reason why. You know, I'm a Presbyterian, and I like it. And I actually, uh, and you, if you know me, you know that, you know, uh, the, the next thing I'm going to say is something congenial, but here I'll just say, I think Presbyterians are right. <laughs> now, the next thing I'm going to say is, you know, but I'm not. I don't have time to say something congenial. You just have to take my word for it. I am a congenial guy. And therefore, it's kind of, it, it, it makes me wonder why it is that even though there have been places in the world in which uh, God has used Presbyterians to uh, really do amazing revival. I mean, largely, uh, you know, 1%, 100 years ago, 1% of the Korean population, Christian, you know, uh, 100 years later, like 40%, and to a great degree, a lot of that was Presbyterian. God, God used the Presbyterian churches for a great revival. But, you know, it's odd, you know, there in Africa, he sort of worked with the Anglicans, and down in Latin America, he did that with the Pentecostals, and like, uh, you know, why is he doing that? I mean, I thought, weren't we right? I mean, we're right. 
And uh, so why would God honor people who don't have the right view of several things, several important things? And the answer is, I don't know, but he just does. And I think it's because uh, as hard as we try, uh, uh, this is a, it's, it's taken me years to admit this, but I said, you know what? I'm not sure everybody in New York City who becomes a Christian is going to want to be a Presbyterian Christian. <laughs> I don't think they're all going to want to be Pentecostal. I don't think they're all going to want to be Baptist or Anglican. But you know what? If, if, you've got, if you've got vibrant church planting movements in all those various traditions, you're much more likely to reach the broad range of people in a city. And you know, you, you know why what I just said was controversial, so, but there it is. Um, I really do believe that the, the differences between denominations are significant. I don't think they're insignificant, but I also know that uh, we're, we've all got something wrong and we're not totally sure what it is. I mean, every one of us, we've got something right and something wrong and we've got to be humble toward each other. And we also see that God uses people that believe the basic gospel together. And so he uses them and out they go. And, and so you need that. I'll tell you why I've put, now I'm about to get to ring three, Ring one, the theological vision. Ring two, five or six, at least, vital church planting movements in your city. A church planting movement is when you have a group of churches in which the majority of those churches plant another church every five years. Uh, a range of them so that there's different kinds of churches going. Now, why do I put this before I talk about parachurch ministries and other kinds of ministries? I'll tell you, and I don't think it's a bias. The main way to build the foundation for the whole body of Christ is to build up the church. The church is the one kind of ministry that you have to invest money in to start it, but after two or three years, as, as the Lord blesses, it becomes self-supporting, and more than that, it becomes a funder of all the other ministries in the city. There's no other ministry that happens like that. Uh, the, the, churches, the churches are communities in which all the other kind of ministries uh, the, the people doing those ministries need homes, they need, they need communities, they need communities of Christians who are different. The, the parachurch ministries tend to be specialists, but the uh, local church tends to be a generalist church with all kinds of people of different kinds of uh, you know, ages and races and so forth. Uh, and it, there's a certain sense in which the spiritual oxygen for everything else, else that's going to happen in the city uh, is being produced by the churches. The churches produce the oxygen so all the other plants can breathe. The churches produce the funders. They develop the number of people who can give. Uh, the, 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 you've got to expand the church or all the other things you want to see happen in the city aren't going to happen. So first of all, you have the first ring, the theological vision. The second ring, which is the uh, church planting movement. And then the third ring. Now the third ring and if you were just offended because you feel like I lifted up the church over other ministries, now you'll be offended because I'm talking about how great those ministries are uh, and the church can't do everything. So uh, maybe I should just go now, or leave now. But um, In this third circle are a whole bunch of what I'll call specialist ministries that it, particularly in a city need to be there and they need to be in interactive relationship with the local churches. The local churches support them they also bring people into the local churches. Here's how it goes. So for example, the first one of these specialist ministries you need out there in that third ring is a united movement of prayer. You might not need to have as long a title on it as Jonathan Edwards put on it. But I, in New York City, uh, an awful lot of the church planting, uh, the un there's an enormous amount of, of uh, church planting going on in New York City, especially in the very center of it. It's an unusual amount, and it's an, there's an unusual amount of cooperation going on between different agencies and, uh, and, uh, and denominations. And one of the reasons for it is it's grown out of a prayer movement. The one thing that people can do across denominations and across the racial barriers is pray. And if you get people together to pray, it creates, it brings down uh, relationship barriers. It creates a unity for, to uh, which not only, in a sense, uh, produces a spiritual power for everything that's happening in a city, but it actually can be the basis for all sorts of other things happening. It, it's a place where people meet. It's, actually, it's a kind of, you know, it's almost like the prayer movement is a small Christian city in which human capital comes together, comes into proximity, and all sorts of innovations bubble out of it. So number one, uh, prayer movement. Number two, specialist evangelism. Now, by specialist evangelism, I mean, I don't, is, is, you know, I'm an evangelist, basically, and uh, that's at my heart and my church, but
But I also know that it, there are all sorts of people groups in a city, uh, you know, from uh, people groups of certain religions uh, to certain ages to certain kinds of people. I mean, uh, ministries to businessmen or women, ministries to Hindus, you know, ministries to kids. Uh, in other words, specialist ministries are, are men, people who, who feel a burden for a particular kind of person and who develop uh, the kind of uh, skill set to reach out to certain places and certain people groups that the local church probably isn't going to be able to do. And you need, especially in a city, tons of those. In particular, let me just suggest that, and some of you are going to be happy when I say this, youth and campus ministries in cities are even more important than they are elsewhere, even though they're important everywhere. And the reason is because that college students, university students in a city, when they graduate, if they've got a vision for the city, they've got a vision for church involvement, they've got a vision for ministry, they don't have to leave to find a job. See, in other words, uh, students that you work with in State College, Pennsylvania, or East Lansing, or places like that, they have a tendency, they, they, they come out and they have to go someplace to get jobs. It's not true in Chicago or New York City or L.A. In other words, if you, you can have a real leadership pipeline if you're willing to, to look at the university students in your city and, and see the ones who've come to faith and the ones who are being discipled and, and create connections between those ministries and ministry training and the church uh, that's your future. That's your, those are your future leaders. And also, if you've gone to, if you've gone to, to uh, uh, college in a city, it, it urbanizes you. In other words, you get to know how to handle a city. Uh, very often, you're, they're, they're more like, they're almost, they're almost like natives. They're almost like people who have grown up in the city, whereas a lot of us who move into the city and we haven't lived in the city, we, you know, we're foreigners and it takes us years to adjust. So you need prayer movement, number one. Number two, specialized evangelistic Ministries, especially youth and campus. Number three, justice and mercy. I'm going to talk about that tonight, and you're going to be talking about it all day, I guess. But the, the, church, the church of Chicago, you know, the, especially the, the churches of Chicago have to be known for their mercy and justice. They have to be, they have to be famous. You know, as, I think I got this from Gordon McDonald years ago. Gordon McDonald said, uh, you're doing it right when the people in your neighborhood say, I don't believe what they believe, but I'll tell you something, if they ever left, I don't know what we'd do without them, we'd have to raise taxes. So, uh, and, and by the way, M Mercy and Justice Ministries, the reason I put them in, in out here is not that I don't think the church should do anything, but so many of the kinds of needs that are out there, there's all kinds of needs from neighborhoods that really have tremendous needs to people groups that have incredible needs. Uh, usually it takes people coming together, not just the church, one church doing it, or even a couple of churches. It usually means Christians who come together into what used to be called voluntary societies. Uh, we, can, we can call them uh, charitable organizations, 501c3s. They come together uh, and they bring, they bring the resources of all the churches and of, uh, they bring the human resources of all the churches across the city to bear on a particular problem. So that's got to be in ring three. So prayer movement, specialist evangelism, Justice and mercy, faith and work initiatives. Uh, even if you're a large church, you're not going to have all the artists, you're not going to have all the financial people, you're not going to have all the journalists. And the Christians in the city uh, who are in their field, though they have to be very involved with their local church, also need to form these kinds of citywide uh, vocational fellowships in which the, uh, the Christians in that particular vocation come together to open doors for each other, to, to mentor each other, to uh, try to develop theological wisdom about what it means to, be a, to, to do their job in a distinctively Christian way. Faith work initiatives tend to, again, be sort of citywide, and they're in ring three. Uh, so we have prayer movement, specialist evangelism, justice and mercy, faith work. Number five, for Christian families to live their lives out in the city, you usually need institutions that support family life. The most obvious are schools, though urban Christian schools have got to be as concerned about their neighbors as they are about the church and, you know, the, and serving Christians. But you need, you need institutions that support family life. That's enough for that. Uh, number six, you need ministry training and theological training pipelines so that people who are being trained for ministry in the city are really getting an urban training and not just training somewhere else and then brought in here and then having to be almost retrained. You've got to have your own pipelines. And last of all, the various leaders of all of these different things in the rings, 
pastors, uh, you might say parachurch leaders, uh, business leaders who are Christians, artists who are Christians. The, the, the leaders of all of this have got to have an unusual amount of unity and love for each other, a lack of turf consciousness. Um, that's a problem just inside the, the, the second ring of, ch of churches. It's hard, to get, for, it's hard for pastors to even get together because who's calling the meeting? And whoever's calling the meeting looks like that's the person who's got the power. It's, it's bad and it's troubling. But uh, uh, it, it's, it's one of the secrets, I would say, to not just a bunch of disparate things going on, but a movement, a gospel movement that's actually changing the city. It needs to have that kind of unity. Now, in conclusion, if you get all those pl things in place, and I, I know many cities that are, that are good in a couple of things and completely lacking in some other elements. When they're all in place, it really begins to get its own energy going and you get to what I call a gospel movement tipping point. And the gospel movement tipping point means it starts to just, it, 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 it does, it, it moves forward under its own power. You don't need money from outside, you don't need one or two uh, important people on the inside, bishop type people pulling all the strings. There's no one command center. It's just that there's enough new churches happening and enough new leaders being produced and an, uh, enough new uh, uh, financial supporters that are, that are growing up. And in other words, the whole movement just starts to grow almost spontaneously. What is spontaneous combustion? It's combustion without a, an external ignition. You don't need something from the outside. It just goes. And you begin to see that you've gotten to a movement tipping point when you begin to realize that the number of people going to church in your city is growing uh, a couple times faster than the population is growing. And then lastly, I think you actually can get to a city tipping point. What's a city tipping point? My guess is that if you are, let's just say you're going from 1% of the population of you know, the center of Chicago being part of you know, great gospel teaching churches to 2% to 5%, where do you get, when do you get to the place where it begins to actually change the way in which the city and the culture goes. I mean, I, I've heard that uh, prison fel a couple of prison fellowship people have told me that, you know, you can get a lot of convicts becoming Christians, but, but when you get to 10 or 15 percent of the prison becomes Christian, it actually changes the culture. It changes the way people relate to the, you know, the prisoners and the guards. It changes the way that the, the prison even looks. How many people have you got to get in Chicago before it actually begins to... Christianity is clearly influencing the way things are done. I don't know, but I know this. When the average resident in downtown Chicago, when the average resident knows one other Orthodox, Evangelical, born-again Christian that they respect, because probably that means 10 or 15% of the population would be believers. If you get to the place where most people know uh, a, a Christian and respect that person, do you realize what a change? Right now in Chicago and New York and most places like that, most people don't have somebody in their mind like that. And as a result, Christianity is not even an option for them. They, they, it's just, they, they believe every stereotype about us. But if you get to the place where enough folks who people really respect, they see what they're doing in the city and they know Christians, you know, if most everybody in the center of your city knows Christians and really respects them, that's going to, that is going to create a huge, um, uh, it's going to create huge, uh, a force of almost a wind that will make more and more people open to the gospel. I'm speaking like a human being here because God can do what he wants to do. He sometimes sovereignly comes in and just does something without all this, but I believe this is in a sense our way of creating an altar. We're building an altar when you catalyze an ecosystem and you do all the things we're talking about. We're building an altar and then we have to say, Lord, you send down the fire. That's an overview of how to reach city. Why, what, and how. And for the rest of our brief time, we're going to be looking at various spots. Nobody can get to every one of the workshops. That's what I hate about these places. I wish I want to go to all of them, but I can't because of time. But maybe as a body, we're all going to be better able to reach our cities when we're done. Let me close in prayer. And then John Dennis is coming up, right? Let's pray. Our Father, we're so grateful to you that you have... Uh, uh, put us in this place.
place. I, I thank you for the people who are here seeking to reach Chicago. I also know there's plenty of people here that are here from other cities and they're trying to learn uh, on how to reach their own city. I pray if I've said anything here that uh, is not helpful or is even uh, perhaps uh, not the wisest that they would forget what I said. And if I've said anything here that's helpful, uh, if, it's any, if I've said anything that you want them to know and, and believe and understand and act on, I pray that it would sink in and bear great fruit in their lives. Help us, Lord, reach the cities that we live in because we believe it will glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.